Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage. Today's clip came from an interview we did with Marty Stewart. In this interview, Marty talks about his great band, The Fabulous Superlatives. We hope you enjoy it. If you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Again, Marty Stewart. Welcome back to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage with Marty Stewart. So, uh, I'd like to talk some more about the superlatives. Um, like I said, I love that band. I love the, the, the new membership in it as well. And I remember Chris coming by my guitar shop and just hanging out. And I thought he was a really cool kid, you know. And I was just so happy when I saw that he was in your band. And uh, so how did that happen? We had done 156 episodes of a television show that celebrated traditional country music. And every time we needed just that, that guy that could kind of come in and do anything from playing non-pedal steel to sock rhythm to adding, you know, flair to the set, Scruggs came around. And um, I would call Chris, and if he was available, he'd come play with us. And it always just fit. And so when we, we understood that Paul Martin was going to leave and, and uh, go work with his family, Kenny and Harry and I got together, and I said, who you? Where do you find another superlative? Mm -hmm. You can't exactly walk out and find just anybody that knows the language of what we do and, and all the ins and outs of it, the nuances of that. And Chris's name came up. I said, well, call Chris. Kenny, his assignment was call Chris and see if he knows anybody. And Chris said, how about me? And, and he called me back and told me, I went, you got to be kidding. And so it worked perfectly because, you know, I'd known Chris since... He was a kid, mm -hmm. and he just felt like family. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole Flat and Scruggs empire. You know, once once you within ten miles of being a Foggy Mountain people, you're always a Foggy Mountain people. Mm -hmm. And he has that same sparkle. Uh, you know, any Foggy Mountain boy that ever, if you ever met any that walked into a room, the sun came out. There was just something about those guys. And Scru Chris Scruggs has that same thing. He walks in a room, and the room lights up. He's one of those characters. Yeah, he just he just fits perfectly yeah. on stage, and I love his I love his bass playing too. You know? Oh, that that was the most surprising thing, is the first because I really love upright bass on some things, you know, and I knew that he was one of those kind of guys that could tell you what color shirt Jerry Bird was wearing when he played on that session, you know, mm -hmm. or, or what Johnny Seibert did when he was playing with Carl Smith. He 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 is just brilliant mm -hmm. source of information when he comes to that. He is full of that sort of knowledge, but I had no idea when he played upright bass that he was such an artist. You know, his his left and right hand are just impeccable. Mm -hmm. His slappage, <laughs> and he can walk through, you know, and, and show you how Fred Maddox played it, or how Bob Moore would have played it, mm -hmm. or how Junior Husky would have played it, mm -hmm. and on and on and on. He's just he's one of those encyclopedic kind of characters, you know. Uh, on the other end, six string Kenny. Uh, I, he's got to be one of my favorite guitar players, period, you know. I mean, and, and like you say, he's got that image, too. He's it's kind of quirky, you know, in a way looking, but, he, you know, but it's, 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 it's perfect, you know. The what all three guys share and what any superlative has always said is it, we are all, as a, as a group, collectively and individually, students of, of so many various forms of music. Mm -hmm. We are students. And on the other side of that, I see all those guys as professors because they can sit in whole court with anybody, whether it's a, a young musician getting started or an old timer that we love and, you know, and honor. But all of those guys, it's 24 hours a day and on the bus. It's music, mm -hmm. music, music, music. And that's the way I like it. I don't care mm -hmm. about politics. I don't care about all of those kind of things that tend to you know, fame and fortune that get inside of bands and get inside of heads, you know, that's not what the superlatives was ever about. It's about championing something. And one day, after we started, I, I, I remember thinking, we have been honored guests everywhere we've gone. We did a record called Soul's Chapel, about the, dis you know, kind of honoring the disappearing sound of Mississippi Delta gospel, staple singers kind of mm -hmm. sound. And there was a Live at the Ryman Bluegrass record. Uh, we did a record called Badlands that shined the light on the Lakota people in South Dakota mm -hmm. that are a big part of my life. But one day I went, 
I, we're honored guests, but I don't feel like we have any place to drive our sword and go, this is our territory, mm -hmm. this is our flag. And one day, traditional country music came forward. I went, ah, that's what I love the most. It makes me, it makes my heart fill up. It's a disappearing culture that is so poor, important. And we have about five minutes left to get the great ones, as well as the young people coming on that still love it. And that's why that TV show, the Marty Stewart show mm -hmm. on RFD, came forth. But Kenny uh, has always been like, it's it, my, my, my partner, and it's in that guitar world because it's interesting you can take everybody if you're recording off and just shove up our two faders and we've never talked we usually we never if we talk about something it's about you know that long but but the parts do this is like a tapestry mm -hmm. he's he's really really a a deep well of knowledge in so many different ways his tributaries run deep and it's so fun to play with him how did this uh, tour happen recently uh, with uh, Chris from um, The Birds? Roger and Chris? Mm -hmm. Well, Roger McGuinn came and did our TV show twice. And, you know, there's a Birds connection probably because of the Clarence White guitar that I play, mm -hmm. that old pull string. And Roger and I met years ago, and it was like instant. And I just love Roger. He's my brother. and. Um, Again, Bird's World is kind of like um, Foggy Mountain World. You know, you know, once a bird. Mm -hmm. And I had never met Chris Hillman really met formally and shook hands a time or two. But Roger came and did our TV show, and we got to be the birds. And we were, one thing about that TV show, we worked hard on playing the record, mm -hmm. putting people back in the frame that made them, you know, made us fall in love with them as an mm -hmm. audience. And I wanted to follow Roger, you know, home and, and just keep playing. And so we were in Austin, Texas, and my phone rang one day. Hey, man, it's Roger. And we were in the airport in Santa Domingo, or he and his wife, uh, Camilla. And it's the 50th anniversary of the Sweetheart record. Would you guys be interested in going out and playing a few shows? I went, the answer is yes. I don't care what the deal is. The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And we, we would shed that record out on the road, and we got to be the birds, and that tour was magic. It was what music is really all about. I heard it was all, I missed it, Oh, man, it was every night, you know. Some songs better than others on night A or night B, but in general, what I loved about it is, is people that love going to concerts and grew up on those records and have held them in their hearts all these years they got to come and see it because most of them thought that they would never see it mm -hmm. ever again. Right. And there's Hillman and there's McGuinn and there's Clarence's guitar and there's, you know, Scruggs playing steel when playing Lloyd Green's parts and Harry singing those harmonies that, you know, Crosby and those guys used to do and me and Kenny would swap off doing whatever we needed to do. It was awesome. It was a, a tour of a lifetime. I think the, when the birds did, um, Mr. Tambourine Man, it kind of shifted the whole music industry, didn't it? I mean, that was kind of the the first blending of folk and rock or something like that. Weren't they called the American Beatles? I yeah. Think, I think they were referred yeah. to as yes. that. Mm -hmm. When I first came to Nashville, I, I really was invited up here by Roland White, Clarence White's brother, who was in Lester Flatt's band. I'd met him on the Bluegrass Festival circuit when I was 12. He gave me his phone number, said, call me sometimes, you know, maybe you could come up and ride the bus with us for a weekend. And I got kicked out of school for reading a country music song roundup instead of studying in my history book. And I called Roller and I said, this would be a wonderful time to come see you. Labor Day weekend, 1972. And I came up here and within the course of a week, Lester Flatt offered me a job. But I noticed, and I lived at Roland's house, my folks were still in Mississippi, but I noticed that Roland had a great record collection. But there were a stack of birds records, Kentucky Colonels and birds records. I said, what's the deal with the birds? He says, my brother Clarence plays with them. So I had that sound in my head. And after Roland left the band to go back and work, he and Clarence and their other brother Eric put a band together for a few months before Clarence got killed, um, I discovered a record called Sweetheart of the Rodeo. Mm -hmm. And I liked it because it was the first time that I heard folk and honky-tonk and rock and roll and hard country, bluegrass and gospel music collide mm -hmm. successfully. And 
not long after that, Lester Flat played a show in Cincinnati. Dig this. It was Lester Flat, Cool and the Gang, and Chickaria. <laughs> <laughs> a college buyer showcase. And we encored nine times. I thought they'd laugh us off, but we encored nine times. And we became rock stars. Lester Flat and the Nashville Guests became rock stars. We played hippie festivals, uh, you know, big old bluegrass festivals, rock shows, the most unlikely things. But one of the first shows was Michigan State, and it was Lester Flat, Graham Parsons, Emmy Lou Harris, and the Eagles when they were starting to tip off Del, uh, Desperado, I think. Mm -hmm. But that night, I saw the Sweetheart of the Rodeo record come to life. And I went, aha, this is how you do it. I remember saying on the bus that night after the show, I said, this is the way to live a musical life. And the old guys just look at me and went, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I've held that in my heart, that, that one record made a profound influence on me. Yeah, I, me too. And uh, golly, the, you know, 12, I mean, you were almost an embryo on the road. I mean, how do you start out that young, man? I mean, how did you, how were you even legally able to do that, you know? Well, I was practicing my autograph in the third grade. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I, and in my hometown, <clears throat> Philadelphia, Mississippi, 380 miles south of here, uh, we had a great radio station, WHOC, still on the air, 1490 on your radio dial, 1,000 watts, pure pleasure. But they would come on the air in the mornings playing country music. Mm -hmm. Noon, there was like an hour of southern gospel. The afternoon was rock and roll top 40, soul late afternoon, and then easy listening classical to sign off. I thought everybody's radio station did. I was like a sponge, but it was country music that I loved the most. It got to my heart. The other got to my head and my feet. Country music got me in the heart. And in 1964, in my hometown, there were three civil rights workers murdered. And the world got ugly down there, really, really ugly. And um, everything about life changed. But on Saturday afternoons, me and my dad would sit close to each other on the couch and watch the Porter Wagner show, and Flatten Scruggs, and the Wilburn Brothers show, and that good old Nashville music, and mm -hmm. Dale Reeves Country Carnival, Johnny Cash show later. And I knew that that train that ran behind our house, I didn't want to go to New York or Hollywood, I wanted to go to Nashville, and put on those kind of clothes, and play Fender guitars and Martin guitars, and get on a, a country music bus, and do that. And I knew that that's the life that I wanted to live. Started my first band when I was nine, and I got here just as fast as I could. And I would have got here five years earlier had I could have. How, how did you get started on, on playing? I mean, it was, did it was somebody in your family play? or My mom played piano at church. Uh, my buddy Butch Hodgins down the street, his wife, or his mama. Not his wife. His mama showed me three chords on the guitar. Tiger by the Tail, G, C, D. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, into the world of country music, that can get you. And that's how it started. And I just simply watched people on TV, listened to the radio. And I had one of those record players you could slow down to, to 16 mm -hmm. and figure things out. But a Johnny Cash record and a Flatten Scruggs record were the first two records that I had. And that became the only two jobs I ever had as a working musician. Mm -hmm. And that, what, what was interesting about our little neighborhood band um, is that the British invasion was really strong at that time. But we played Folsom Prison Blues and Wildwood Flower and Mama Tried and those kind of songs. I felt like it was my job to, to be a correspondent and represent country music mm -hmm. in my neighborhood. And there's nothing different today, it's what I still do. Mm -hmm.